What's going on? Just doing a quick sound check just to make sure everybody can hear me okay. If you can hear me fine, just let me know in the chat. Uh, the song that's playing, you can it's in the description. It's at the very bottom if you want to listen to it. Okay, good. Slight delay. Awesome. Okay, I think we're pretty much ready to get going. Uh, before we start, you know, we do have a new question system here. You can simply just put Q or Q call in question or question call in, in the chat, and then it will push that question over to me on Discord. That way I don't miss it. I try to watch chat during the stream, but it's not always possible to, you know, show the main content and then also focus on chat. So if you want to make sure that your question gets answered live, if it's, if it's relevant, of course, to the stream, then please make sure you put it on, uh, put it in the chat there using the prefixes. So in the meantime, you know, we are going to do a quick Q and A as, as usual on streams. We'll start out with some of the meta topics, channel announcements, updates, things like that. And then we're going to roll into a, probably a five to 10 minute Q and A, which, uh, I'll take any questions that, that people put, you know, during that time. And then we're going to jump into the main content, which, as you probably already know, is we're going to be looking at a, a wireless smart plug. And then we're going to attempt to get some of the APIs that that plug uses out of it. Not physically out of it, but we'll use another technique. And then we're going to try to basically uh, use that plug using another interface besides the one that they give you. So that's, that's our goal for today. So a couple of meta topics in the meantime, again, please ask your questions. So we got a couple, a couple topics. The first is I have some stickers for sale. I, uh, some stickers were donated to the engineer man channel by a, a friend named Emmett. And I have about 300 of them. Since I got them for free, I'm going to be selling them at cost. If you're interested in picking up one or more of those, you can go to emkc.org slash stickers. And that link is also in the description if you want to pick some of those up. They are pretty much sold right at cost, so I'm not making any money on these. It's uh, it's all going to postage and processing fees, shipping and that and that stuff. So if you're interested in getting some of those, go ahead and uh, there are links in the description. You can pick them up there. The last thing is at the very end of the Engineer Man live stream, season two is going to be a project review which I'm going to review a bunch of fan projects and I think that'll be really fun. I used to do it as a video series actually where I would review projects, but I, I never had a lot of time, you know, as, as people know, my, my videos tend to be around five to 10 minutes. So it's kind of tough to review anything at any real length. So for the final stream of the season, we'll do, be doing fan project review. If, uh, Oh, thank you very much for the, wow. For the $23. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you for so graciously sharing your knowledge, EM. I, I love sharing my knowledge. I love sharing knowledge in general, whether it's my knowledge or somebody else's knowledge or anything like that. So I, I really hope I'm helping you out, helping everybody, you know, who attends these streams. And, you know, I, I see a lot of uh, the same names every, every stream, which is great because that means that, you know, people are, uh, like what they're seeing here and they're learning some stuff. And I, I guess that means, you know, the intent is met. So uh, thank you so much for that. And if you're on, I, I recognize that profile. I, I think, I think you're bash talks, I think. Uh, so if, if you are, make sure you let one of the staff know and we'll, we'll get you hooked up with the uh, supporter role. So uh, yeah, if you have a project and you want to see it get reviewed on stream, then, oh, something's messed up here. Oh no, nothing's messed up. So yeah, if you have a project that, and you want to see it done on stream at the end of the uh, season two engineer man streams, go ahead and send an email to project review at engineerman.org. And all I ask is that you do send the actual code uh, or a link to the code on GitHub or wherever, you know, don't, don't send me executables. Don't send me pre-compiled binaries. You no, know, I do have to actually look at the code 
the both you know to make sure it's not anything malicious and then of course to make sure i can articulate kind of what it's doing and then it, it of course should run uh, i have so far five submissions that i'm going to be doing i have probably room for another probably five i'm going to we're going to try to fit 10 in a 50 minute period that gives every project five minutes and i think that'll be really cool so uh, it's it, it should be open source projects and depending if i get enough submissions i'll i might take some other stuff but uh definitely definitely send those in it'd be really fun so that's it for the kind of channel updates and announcements i don't have really anything else for that so let's uh, jump into a quick q a and then we're going to get into the content Uh, Javier asked, I, I guess a good level of assembler is necessary, right? Y yes, sometimes. So the thing with like, the thing with hardware devices is you're often getting, everything's already pre-compiled. It's already ready to run on the actual thing that's running on. So you don't generally run into like raw source code. You got to kind of, I don't want to say make source code out of it, but you you gotta you gotta work towards figuring out exactly what it does. There is a case sometimes where that's not true, and that's if the device has something like a like a like a web front end. In, in which case, if it has a web front end, it's most likely going to have some JavaScript and some other things. So you might be able to see the code in that case. But some of the stuff that you know, maybe if the device is written in C or something like that, it's going to be pre-compiled. It's going to be tough to extract. So all you're gonna be left with is kind of the assembly. So do you need an understanding? If you want to reverse engineer literally any IoT device, then you're probably gonna need an understanding of that, but it's not always required. And you're gonna see in this case that we're gonna be able to do something cool with it with no knowledge of assembly. Uh, what's the background music? Okay, I already answered that. API Chromecast from Google Reverse. I, I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but I, that's not the one we're doing today. Today we're going to be doing a smart plug, just a, just a cheap, just a cheap Chinese smart plug. The ones you get for like 15 bucks for a two pack, and we'll be kind of doing something with that. That's going to be our target device for the day. Uh, Gaurav, I, I don't understand that question. Thoughts on, on lightweight IDs or AV for IoT devices? Something to protect against attacks like... Uh, I'm not sure I understand that question. If you want to re-ask that question, just add a little more context and maybe I can answer that. Uh, Gidra, use and explain. So Gidra is... I think if I'm not mistaken, that's that's the NSA product, and that's that's probably a little it's probably a little advanced for what we're using today. But that's I, I think that's an NSA developed like advanced framework for analyzing and dissecting firmware specifically. Uh, we won't be getting into that today, but it's definitely a prominent tool out there. As is uh, I don't know how to pronounce it Radiri for Radir too. So that's something that we might look later, possibly in another video. Oh, that's the other thing. I, I just put out a video on reverse engineering firmware, and I'm going to be putting out a video where I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to pull the actual firmware off the device using UART and serial connections. So be on the lookout for that video. I don't want to cover that here because I think that's definitely a, a, a good discrete video topic that I think I could make something nice with. Uh, what brand of smart plug? It's it's uh it's like it's like YTE, oh, uh, Tuya I, I think is the name. It's it's just some some off brand. It's there's there's not a whole lot to it. In fact, hold on one second. So I actually bought two of them. You know, one I'm using in the demonstration today. The other I took apart. So. You know, the plug looks like this. If you take it apart, it's nothing more than just, and I, I kind of mangled this one. <laughs> 
plastic's all torn up, but it's really just a plugs on one end and then you plug the device in on the other end and then that's that's kind of the whole thing. There's a little button on the side for uh toggling it on and off, but I, I think it's a I think it's a YTE a smart plug. It's if you go on Amazon and just Google Wi-Fi smart plug, it's it's gonna be any of them that are, you know, a two pack for like eighteen dollars. You know, they're they're very inexpensive. It's just cheap, no name, Chinese stuff. So and then the the, the reason I have this one apart is because the, the second video that I do the follow up to the other reverse engineering video is, you know, this, this particular thing uses an ESP 8266 S3, which means that there are some, there are some pads. Uh, it's going to be tough to see, but you know, there's some, of course it's not going to focus, but there's some pads down there where we can solder in some wires and actually hopefully get, you know, some sort of serial console, which we can use to, you know, get the firmware off of this. So uh, hopefully that works. If it doesn't, I have other devices that you know I can mess with and we'll make something work. So I think it'll be fun. Uh, Daniel asked, I would like to learn Linux sysadmin. Would you recommend learning programming, reverse engineering, ethical hacking together with it? I would definitely, so reverse engineering, ethical hacking, they both involve some level of programming skills. So certainly, you know, certainly programming should come first. And a lot of Linux sysadmin, like systems administration is a lot of commands and it's a lot of uh, scripting, like bash scripting. So you want to have a good understanding of programming. You can then learn the remainder of it as well. You know, ethical hacking, of course, allows you to administrate servers better because if you know the weaknesses of your server then you can make sure that you close the holes on that uh, is it difficult to reverse just bare metal firmware versus linux based what is your advice for reversing bare metal firmwares so I mean, beyond like getting access to a serial console and pulling firmware off a device, anything beyond that is kind of just beyond my knowledge. I, I don't know what I would do past that point. And by bare metal, I, I assume you mean, you know, the actual software is, you know, in the chip. So uh, if I can't get access to it with a UART, then I don't actually know what the next step is. I'm, I'm sure there's ways to, you know, pull the software off of there, but that's just beyond my knowledge. Uh, is reverse engineering in the same realm as pen testing where it's not really profitable but fun to do on the side? So there's actually, that's actually a really good question because there are there are legitimate reasons why you'd want to reverse engineer uh, besides just, you know, something fun. You know, the first is, of course, in security. You know, if you are a security researcher and you need to make sure that a particular hardware device is not susceptible to any problems, maybe your third party is doing an audit on it, then it makes perfect sense to try to rip that, you know, device apart, get access to the software and analyze what's going on in there. Uh, the other thing is a lot of companies, you know, like if company A puts out a new gadget or an appliance or whatever, company B is immediately going to take that, you know, that gadget or appliance or whatever, they're going to take it back to their shop and they're going to tear that thing apart and they're going to start reverse engineering it to figure out exactly what the company is doing with it. So that's a common tactic in, in, I mean, that's, it's a, it's a common tactic in business. That's, that's just what they're going to do because they want to learn about it. So, you know, profitable, you know, can you make money reverse engineering? E yes, you make money because people hire you to, you know, reverse engineer things and, and, you know, try to shed a light on what people are doing. Cool. I'm just reading the chat here. Okay. I think that's really it for the questions for now. Uh, still ask your questions. We'll do a second Q and A at the end. So if you didn't get your question answered this time around, which I, there's only a couple I didn't just because they weren't relevant or I didn't understand them. Uh, also, I, I see some questions in there that don't have the prefix. Make sure you put the right prefix, Q, Q colon, question or question colon. Otherwise, I it, I run the risk of uh, missing it in the in the chat. 
All right, so let's jump into the main content. What we're doing today, let me let me get out of let me get out of this here. Okay. So if you look in the top right hand corner there, you can see that there's a there's a lamp. And our goal today is to turn off. Now that lamp is plugged into my smart plug. Smart plug is plugged into the wall. So our goal today is to turn off that lamp with an HTTP client. That's our goal. If we can do that, then we succeeded. So when you buy these smart plugs, what you're going to get access to is, uh, and, and just for some, just for some kind of, you know, kind of context, this over here, I have my, uh, I have, I have a phone. It's actually a physical phone that I'm just running through a, I'm just like mirroring the screen to my computer. So I have a, I have a physical phone here and to control this lamp, you'd, you'd be given this app. And in this case, it's called Mini Smart Plug. And this is really all they give you. They give you an app, they give you the plug, and then you press the power button. You, know, you press the power button and the light goes off. You know, on, off, on, off. So, and that's that's kind of the extent of it. The, the problem is if you want to use this in any meaningful way, you have to do it through their system. So they offer a couple of things. You know, they offer a timer. You know, you could say like, uh, turn it off in a minute or turn it off at a certain time. You, know, you can set a schedule or whatever. But beyond that, it, <laughs> it doesn't really do a whole lot, you know, which which is kind of kind of garbage. Now, it does it does integrate in with other places. You know, like I think you can hook it to like Alexa and Google Home or whatnot. But what if you wanted to just programmatically turn this thing on and off? How how would you go about doing that? Well, the answer is you can't. <laughs> You know, you, you, you can't do it because they don't allow you to do that. So what we're going to attempt to do today is figure out what, you know, what is this app, what is this app doing to make this particular smart plug turn on and off? And then we're going to try to replicate that like an HTTP client. So um, before we go any further, though, it, it's, it's worth mentioning that there's a lot of methods to do this. And, you know, of course, we're dealing with a mobile app, but there are cases where you buy smart devices, IoT devices, uh, very common with IP cameras where you might have a web interface because once you hook these up to the network, they get an IP. And then sometimes you can just type that IP into your browser and then you get some interface. Now, this is not the case with this device. There's no web interface to, to you know, get access to, but typically... If you do get a web interface, your life just got really easy because as soon as you log in to their, you know, interface, whatever, whatever they've offered you, you just pop open Chrome DevTools and then you start watching the network calls that are getting made. You know, the reason it makes it so easy is because Chrome is accessible. You know, Chrome has Chrome and Brave, you know, anything with Chromium, you know, has very very high tech development tools, but the one per, the one important thing is that any time you take an action in a browser, you can see what that action is doing right there on the console. So, like, if I had a web interface for this smart plug, all I'd have to do is just click on, <laughs> and then it would show me exactly what it's doing. The problem with on the Android side is. I don't have access to that. Like this is not Chrome. I'm pointing at my phone. Sorry. You know, this is not, this is not Chrome over here. You know, this is actual Android. So I can't like, I can't, I can't see what happens when I press that button. So, but there are ways to see what happens when I press that button. And then that's what we're going to kind of go into now. So, you know, I, I, I kind of have a bunch of methods that I would use to, to kind of figure it out. I ordered them in, you know, di in order of difficulty. So, Web app is uh, super easy. Now, we don't have a web app, so we move on. So if you have a mobile app, you can do what's called a man in the middle. And essentially what a man in the middle is, is when you take a computer and you insert it between the phone and the internet, or the phone and, not the phone and the internet, but the phone and its destination. If you can get a computer in between those two devices, then you have the ability to listen to the traffic that's going to the destination. So the problem with this is this is why HTTPS exists. So HTTPS, as you know, makes it so 
information can be transmitted over the internet in a secured way. So, and the HTTPS also prevents man in the middle attacks in most cases. So the question becomes, how can we make this work? So there's a couple different tools we can use. You know, the first is called MITM proxy. And MITM proxy sometimes works. The, the thing about MITM proxy is it's, it's a program that what you do is you have your phone route all the traffic to MITM proxy running on your computer. And the, the pitfall is that on Android, apps are free to ignore a configured proxy server. And this is bad because I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna have time to actually show it, so I'll just kind of describe what would happen. So if I were to run MITM proxy on my computer, and then I were to do it on my phone and, and click this on off button, I would see that it still goes on and off and I don't actually see anything in the console. And this happens because this app is choosing to just ignore my proxy settings. So that kind of, that kind of removes it as a viable way to even make it work. And keep in mind, this is on unrooted phones because unrooted phones follow specific rules they they got to do what the android subsystem you know tells it to and that's kind of that if if you're on a rooted phone then you have the ability to make it so everything goes through the proxy server but in our case we're dealing with an unrooted phone so a simple mitm attack with mitm proxy not really going to work but if it were to work the you know, it would involve basically hijacking HTTPS traffic in transit. And this is done by pretending like, you know, I am the destination. So I insert myself between the phone and the endpoint. And then I say, phone, I'm actually who you want to be saying this data to. And then the phone says, sure, here's the data. And then I try to decrypt that data and I try to read it. But this presents a whole new set of problems. You know, the reason that this can't happen that often on the internet is because we have what's called SSL certificates. And SSL certificates, they have, you know, without going into a big, long, extended kind of, you know, kind of explanation on SSL certificates, just know that for a certificate to be valid, the certificate has to be signed on a device with a certificate that is also valid on the server it's connecting to. And the way this happens is clients store lots of root certificates and then certificate vendors give out certificates that are signed by those root certificates. And in this way, you can guarantee that the traffic is in fact encrypted because it's connecting to a place that has a certificate that was signed by the one on the device. So if I insert myself in between that connection, the problem that's going to happen is it's going to show up as, as you know, a bad certificate. It's going to say, Hey, there's a problem. This is insecure. You know, it, it's not working. And the reason that's an issue is because a lot of the times they program these devices to say, whoa, if you can't verify, you know, the endpoint, then don't send any data, you know, not good. And then that just kills it right there. So it's kind of a tough thing to do, but we can make it happen. And you know why? Because this device is very insecure and it's not doing any of those checks. So they're making it very easy on me. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do a man in the middle attack but we're going to be doing it by performing the attack with a Raspberry Pi. And the role of the Raspberry Pi is what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to a different Wi-Fi network here. This Wi-Fi network is called Pi in the middle. And by connecting to the Pi in the middle network, what this causes it to do is it causes to route all the traffic from this device. Yeah, it says it has no internet. That's because I don't have the actual other end running. So by connecting to this network called Pi in the middle, I'm going to be routing all my traffic through my Raspberry Pi. And on my Raspberry Pi, I'm going to be running 
MIT and proxy. In this way, I don't have to worry about the phone ignoring a proxy server because from the phone standpoint, it's simply just connecting to a Wi-Fi network. It doesn't know what that network's doing. So I'm forcing all of that traffic to run through the Raspberry Pi. So I've done that, but you can see now that everything's broken. If I go to Chrome and I try to just refresh this page, you can see that nothing happens. And that's because the Raspberry Pi, it's not, it's not running at the moment. So if I go to my Raspberry Pi here, I have a script called capture and upload and Pi in the middle. It's a, it, it's a well-supported thing, but it's, it's based on a commercial product called a like cloud. I don't remember the exact name, but it's, it's designed to take the output of MIT and proxy and forward it up to a separate service. We're not doing that here. So I've modified it slightly. I, I've basically reduced the code down to where it just takes the incoming connections and then it writes them out to the actual terminal here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start this capture and upload script. And you can see now that when I come over here to refresh this page, you can see I get this little error and it says your connection is not private. And this is absolutely what it should be doing. This is saying that I see there's a man in the middle attack going on. You should not visit this page, but here's what we can do. We can open up a separate tab. And this is a feature of MITM proxy. And we can go to a thing called MITM.it. And this will give us this page. This page is actually running on the Raspberry Pi. And what this allows us to do is this allows us to insert a fake root certificate onto this Android phone. So I'm just gonna do, you know, like fake cert. So now I have my fake certificate installed. I can get rid of this. If I come back here and I refresh this again, you can see now it actually goes through. Everything's fine. And you can also see that we're, we're getting a lot of information over here. And this is because what my script does is it just logs all of the request URLs and the request headers, and then the actual, you know, the actual body of stuff that's going on. You know, some of this is messed up, but you know, we're also getting uh, some good stuff, but you know, we're not here to do web pages. We're here to do the actual plug. So if we go back to the actual plug, now we should start getting some information here. Okay. Something's actually wrong here. Hold on. My, my thing's frozen. Just give me a second. All right, slight technical difficulties. That's fine. I'll just have to restart that. No big deal. No big deal. There we go. All righty. Sorry about that. So every time I click this button now, you can see something happens and I'm starting to get information. And this is very important because this is actually what this IOT device is sending out to the cloud somewhere. You know, it's, it's worth mentioning that these devices, they maintain a very long lived connection to some place in the cloud. And what happens is when I send a request from the app or wherever, it goes up to the cloud, cloud pushes a message down to the device to say, toggle it or do whatever. So in this case, I have, I, I have a lot of, <laughs> I have a lot of really juicy info here, you know, so I can put a little, you know, put a little blank space here. Okay. I got that. And I got that. And now I can just cancel it. So now I just want to analyze these. You know, I, I, have, I have two blocks of information here. You know, the first block, I know that this information block, this URL is what was caused 
when I clicked to turn off the actual lamp. And this is some juicy info, and you can see it's HTTPS, but that didn't matter because I've performed a man in the middle attack. I was able to get the raw URL, I was able to get all the headers, and I was able to get the request body. And in this way, I now know exactly what this device was sending. So I can, I can do a lot with this. And I can also see the response. You know, the response, this, this was clearly the one that was sent when I turned off the bulb, you know, success, true, status, okay. And then this is when I, I think it got its, uh, you know, got its status. And then the same exact thing happened when I turned the bulb back on. And, you know, there's a couple of things we can, we can pick out here. You know, there, the first thing of interest is this line called tuya.m.device.dp.publish. You know, this is interesting info because this leads me to believe that this is kind of an action that it's taking. This is important information. Now, when I first looked at this, of course, I'm not doing this. You know, I am doing this live, but I, I obviously already did this, you know, prior to the stream. And I saw a couple of things that were a little concerning. You know, the first was this, was this signature. You know, oftentimes, and this is all stuff you got to research. This is going to be different per device. I was a little concerned when I saw the signature because I was thinking that was going to prevent me from doing this because often a signature requires you to combine a lot of data from the app or wherever it's sourced from, string it together and take like a SHA-256 sum of it and then that becomes your signature. The issue with this is, as you know, you don't reverse a hash. Therefore, I don't know what the original value was before the signature was computed. And uh, fortunately, in this case, it didn't matter. All that really mattered is that the URL matched the request body, and then that was kind of that. But if that signature did matter, you might have to dig into the app and reverse engineer that further to figure out exactly what parameters it's taking to compute that signature. Otherwise, you may not be able to make the request. So the thing about HTTP requests here is that they're very easy to replay back at a server. And by replay, I mean send to the server, but not through the app. And the reason they're easy is because HTTP is a standard. You know, if you know the URL and you know the headers and you know the body, and these are all the three things that we have right here, then we can send this request with curl, we can send it with Chrome, we can send it with, uh, you know, Insomnia HTTP client or Postman or, or Python or anything. So this is very juicy data. So the next thing we're going to try to do is turn off this lamp with an HTTP client. So I happen to have one of those. Oops. So I have my HTTP client here. All we're going to do is create a new request and we're going to call it turn light bulb off. So be a post request. And then we're going to go back to our log here and we're going to find the DP publish. Oh, I think it's this one. So all I have to do here is just take this entire URL, drop it in here. Now you can do some debugging, like you could just drop the URL and, and click send. You can see when I click send, it says sing validate fouled. Now, of course, this is just, you know, bad Chinese spelling. You know, really what this meant to say was the sig, you know, sig n, like signature, validate, you know, failed. Of course, it should have been an I in there. You know, permission validation failed. So all this says is that our request is not yet valid, you know, but if we add additional data, we should be able to make this valid. So what we need to do here is we need to start copying these headers in into this, you know, into our actual program here. So it, it's somewhat tedious, but we're going to add a, you know, user agent header. We're going to add a content type. Well, actually, content type we can set with you know, application X form URL encoded. So we'll just set it to for URL encoded. That'll add that automatically. We'll set a, uh, a host, 
a1.tuus.com. So we can drop that in here. Uh, connection keep alive. Whoops. Keep alive. And then accept encoding gzip. So these are be all headers. And we don't actually know if these headers are even required. All we know is that these are the headers that were sent by the uh, app. And you can see that it's the same error message, but but that's fine. You know, we, we still have to insert a couple other things. So you can see that we're inserting a user agent of the Android app. So hopefully we are making the, it's uh, funny. Uh, hopefully we're making the actual endpoint think that we're sending it from the app. And, and th this may be the key to everything. You know, you might have everything perfectly right, but the user agent says curl or insomnia. And then their endpoint says, whoa, 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 we don't process requests from insomnia or curl. We only process it from ty ua equals app slash Android, whatever. So this is very important. It's important that you match the headers exactly as they are and you match the body exactly as they are. So we have our headers, we have our URL. All we got to do now is just fill out our form variables. So we have post data, device ID, and SID. These are easy to copy in. I'll copy in the SID, copy in the device ID. Also, I swear if anybody on here starts turning my light bulbs on and off, I'm going to be very mad. And by very mad, I mean I'm going to be very happy because that'll be pretty cool. So if you want to try to turn my bulb on and off during the stream, please go ahead and do that. And then finally, I'm just going to copy this post data. And this is kind of a weird thing because post data is a form parameter that's actually JSON. So kind of weird. And the one thing we got to look at here is this is one kind of pitfall. You can see that there's a backslash backslash. And it's only backslash backslash because it's a quoted string in Python. So we do have to remove one of these backslashes. And this should be pretty much it. Let's test it. There you go. See that? I ran it and the bulb turned off. Didn't even need the app. No big deal. And obviously, and it even tells us, says result true, success true, status okay. And if I run it again, you know, of course nothing happens because the bulb's already on. So I bet you, I bet you if I, yeah, so the only difference in the request that I noticed is the other request has this as true. The problem is if I just change this to true, you can see that now I get a signature validate failed. And this tells me that this post data is definitely part of what is computing that signature. So we'll have to just go back into our log and, and pull some additional data. So what we can do is we could just duplicate this and this will be turn light bulb on. So for the turn light bulb on, what we're going to do is we're going to ditch the URL, you know, because the URL has a, has a different signature in it. I will copy this in here. That should be the other signature. And then we'll just check the headers are all the same. So we can skip those, the SID, AZ15, Ensign5, A8. Okay, so the SID is the same. The device ID is the same. And then it's DPS1 is uh, true. Set that to true, give it a shot. There we go, got our light back. So now I have, I have two things in Postman. I have turn light bulb off and I have turn light bulb on. Cool, that's it. I don't even need the app anymore. I have an HTTP request that I can make to control this bulb. Now, just this one little fact alone should indicate to you that this just opened up your possibilities for writing interfaces into, uh, oh, I'm using insomnia. Insomnia is the answer. No, it's not Postman, it's not Postman. It's, uh, it's insomnia. But you can use Postman, it's the same thing. I, I use Insomnia just because I like the theme better and I like that side by side, whereas Postman has it you know, vertical and I just really hate that. 
I think it's not the way it should be. So uh, I, I use Postman for probably five years, six, seven years. And I switched to Insomnia just because I think it's a better product. So uh, anyways, this this is great. This is great. I can, I don't even need the app anymore. You just put that aside. Don't even need it. Let's put it over there. It's not important anymore. What is important is that I can make HTTP calls to turn the bulbs on and off. And I'm sure there are other options, you know, with this, like I'm sure I could set a timer. You know, I'm sure if I came in here, let's just look at that. So let's start our capture again here. And let's go back to our app. And let's make sure this still works. Okay, it's good. Let's set a timer for one. You can see as soon as I turn that on, you can see that it sent something up here. What did it do? Yeah, see, look what it did, DPS. So one must be the action of on and off, two must be the action of timer. So this just set this to make it so it turns off in 60 seconds. And I guarantee that if I set that to a one, it would turn off in one second. And so if you just keep using all of their actions, you can fully disassemble everything this device can do. I, I now know that two is for timers. I bet if I set a schedule, I bet it's a three. And I bet anything else you can do with it, maybe it's a four or a five or, or so on. So there's, in this way, I can, I can totally like document this undocumented API because you won't find any of this anywhere. You know, the Tuya web, oh, see it turned off. So the, uh, the Tuya website, they don't, well, actually, let's let's try that one second thing just for fun. And we're going we're going off script now because this is something I didn't intend on doing. So let's do turn light bulb off in one second. So again, we're going to ditch the URL. Put this new URL in the signature. Okay, so the post data is gonna be different. The post data, I'm gonna drop that in there. Be really cool if this worked. Turn a bulb off in one second. That's not even something you can do in the app. And now we're, now we're creating functionality that didn't even exist before. Okay, it looks like the device ID and SID are slightly different. So drop those in there. Oh, you know what? We're not going to be able to do it because the 60 is going to be... Oh, we're not going to be able to do it because by changing from 60 to 1, it's going to change the signature. Oh, what a bummer. Let's try it anyways. Oh, it didn't work. See, it didn't work. Signature validation. So I, I would have to actually, I'd have to dig deeper into this to try to figure out exactly how they're computing that signature. Because all I can really do is, all I can really do is put 60 here. If I put 60, well, it still didn't accept it. So obviously there's, oh, I have backslashes here. Oh, maybe it's just the backslashes was wrong. Hold on. Nah, it doesn't work. You can see I did schedule the 60. So I just sent an HTTP request that should shut this light off here in 60 seconds. But to do less than 60 or one second or whatever, I'd have to find a way to compute that that signature. I just don't know what that is. So that's... Uh, yeah, so we're done with that piece. I, I want to continue talking about a couple other things. I want to talk about if we went through this entire exercise and and we realized that it just didn't work like this wasn't something that we could do there are still other options the next thing that we would have to do and this is very common you're going to run into a lot of iot devices that you're going to try to do exactly this and it's still going to say security certificate problem it's not going to work it's not going to show you the urls or anything 
and then you're gonna have to find another way. And this is when we introduce something called Objection and Frida. And Objection is a program short for Object Injection. Oh, see my light just went off, 60 seconds. So I'm actually gonna turn it back on. Oh, I can turn it back on with my REST client. There it is. So what you could do with Objection is you can, you can, well, it's Objection and Frida. So usually what you do is, Frida is a tool that allows you to basically inspect everything about an APK or an Android package at runtime. And this is very powerful because you can hook into various methods. You can output parameters that are passed to methods. You can basically inspect everything about a program while it's running at the exact time that it's running. The problem with this is, is Frida is, it used to be delivered only as a web server that ran on rooted Android devices, but they've recently introduced a Frida gadget. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to take an APK and it allows you to patch that APK with the Frida gadget built into it and then you install this APK onto your device. And in this way, you can kind of have some free to functionality with an, with an unrooted phone. The pitfall here is that in modifying that APK in that way, because you are going to have a patched APK now, which it might fail signatures and might not be properly signed anymore, is... What I found in my particular case is that when I did that, I was unable to log into my app. And it was, it's funny, I got that same message, signature, you know, permission failed. So I, I was thinking, okay, well, this is obviously preventing me from doing this because it expects the app to look a certain way. And simply because the app does not look a certain way, it's now treating it as invalid and it's not allowing me to do anything else. So I was kind of stopped short at that moment because I, I couldn't even I couldn't even use that. But if you have a root device, this is not a problem. You simply install Frida onto that device and then you install the app as usual. You you put the unpatched app on there because Frida can just hook into it, you know, because Frida's installed at the phone level. Because remember, Android phones are basically just Linux. And if you have a rooted Android device, you effectively can just SSH into your phone <laughs> and do whatever you want inside there. So that pretty much will always work. And that's because it's, it's like, it's like you're inspecting the, it, 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 it's almost like Chrome dev tools for your Android app <laughs> at that point. And that's almost guaranteed to work. So, but now, you know, this doesn't answer another question. You know, there's there's one kind of unanswered question here, and it's that what if what if this Tuya smart plug, whatever, you know, cloud service suddenly ceased to exist? You know, what if we could just send a message right to the plug to do something? And to do this, we really have to break this bad boy apart and actually dig into it to figure out exactly what's going on. There's a couple standards that are typically used. One is called MQTT, and MQTT is you know, standardized in such a way that it's already understood things that you might send to it. The problem is just getting access to, you know, what we did is we looked at what the Android app was sending to the Tuya US endpoint. What we didn't look at is what is the Tuya US cloud server sending to this thing? And that's because, you know, this is even harder to tap into than an Android app. You know, there's no Chrome dev tools for smart plugs, for instance. So for us to look at what's inside this plug involves us to actually get access to this Wi-Fi module here. So that little, that little guy. If we can get access to what's inside there and get access to the software in there, then maybe we can carry out an MITM attack on this plug, in which case we do the exact same thing as we did here, except we catch the incoming data versus the outgoing data. 
So, and to do that involves breaking it apart, it involves locating the UART pads, which I have done, and then it involves actually soldering some stuff to it, and then getting a UART cable, and actually hoping that you can get access to something. Even if you get this far, there's still another roadblock. It may be encrypted. There may be a key that is burnt into a chip somewhere that is the only thing that can unlock this firmware, in which case there's a whole host of new problems. And, and this is also why, you know, this is why it's a good challenge. This is why this is a very interesting space is because some of them are really easy, you know, and uh, there's people on my server who can attest this, you know, Russian hackers specifically, is some of these devices are very simple. <laughs> you hook a UART cable and you get a root shell and you're done. There's no encryption, no obfuscation. You download it, you can patch it, you can do whatever. So uh, more on that later. Let me, I want to look at some questions here make sure I make sure I'm caught up on all the, all the questions. Oh, some guy in Sandy asked, can you read the data that is transmitted when you press the pairing button on the plug, please? So in this case, that would be Bluetooth. And can you intercept Bluetooth? Yes, you can just you can intercept Bluetooth the same way that you can intercept outgoing HTTP calls is you can hook in to the actual code in the APK that sends info to the plug via Bluetooth and receives info from the plug via Bluetooth. And you can read it in that way. Of course, to say exactly how, you know, is kind of beyond what I can say today, but it happens in the same way. Because in the end, Android has Bluetooth APIs that have receive and transmit functions, and you read them in that way. Yeah, thoughts on MQTT from a security perspective and using Node-RED for IoT automation. So I don't have a, like I'm not a, I'm not a super grand master of, of MQTT. I, I have used it before. I understand how it works. I understand its protocol. I understand how it hooks into things, but from a security perspective, you know, IoT is a big, a big cat and mouse game. You know, as IoT technology grows, the need to secure it grows, and there's so many things hooked up to the internet now that, you know, it's a big. Also, what's everyone waiting on? How come this light hasn't, uh, how come how come this light hasn't turned on and off yet? Here, let me. Never mind. Anyways. Uh, yeah, it's a big cat and mouse game. You know, it's always, you know, it's always the security professionals are always trying to stay ahead of the hackers, and you know everybody's doing their best. So, uh, is it secure? It's probably about as secure as we're going to get right now. But you know, what is MQTT really? I mean, it's just a long-lived connection that can take push messages from some. I think they call it broker. I think it's the technical term, and. If the answer is yes, then then everything's fine. Uh, thoughts on Tasmoda firmware? I I don't actually know what that is. Sorry. Is the Bluetooth protocol as simple as HTTP? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It is not. And I I can say that from firsthand experience. I used to work in digital monitoring, and I had to do integrations against Bluetooth devices that would do like air quality monitoring and, and things like that. And Bluetooth is a disaster, you know, when it comes to that kind of stuff. Whereas HTTP is very well defined. There's not a whole lot of gotchas. HTTP clients are very simple. They're everywhere. Piece of cake. Bluetooth, not so much. And it's due to like, you got Bluetooth devices and you got Bluetooth characteristics and the protocol is just very confusing. And it also spans multiple versions with different protocols. So not fun. Anytime I got to work with Bluetooth, it's not, it's just not a fun day for me. So we got about six minutes left. Just making sure I got all the questions done. Let's look through chat here. Okay, Zach knows about Tasmoda characters. I'm sorry, Tasmoda uh, firmware. 
Okay, let me make sure I've covered all my notes here. Yeah, so I guess we'll just use the last uh, few minutes just to review kind of kind of what we did here. You know, we started out with an app and we ended with being able to turn a smart plug on and off without even using that app. And we did so by performing a man in the middle attack. You know, one kind of method among many methods to kind of make this happen. And you know, you'll notice I said sometimes super easy. You know, it's only super easy if nothing prevents you from doing it. And as far as like preventing me from doing things goes, this was the easiest thing. But even if they're using certificate pinning or even if they're doing peer verification, you can still get by that by using Frida. Frida and Objection out of the box has ways to disable certificate pinning or put your own cert in their root store among other things, which makes it a lot easier. So yeah, there's always, there's always a next step. Really, the only time that it gets really, really hard is when they start doing lots of encryption or obfuscation of their software, and they start like burning in encryption keys onto boards. Oh, some guy in San Diego, thank you for the 1111. Thanks for the IoT introduction, EM. I, I appreciate that. Uh, longtime supporter and stream attender, some guy in Sandy. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for thanks for coming seeing us today. Uh, hopefully everybody got a lot out of this. And definitely look more into Frida and Objection. It is super powerful tools that let you hook into any part of the Android app and view you know past parameters to function calls, view like returned information from a function call. You can actually even inject new code. <laughs> I actually forgot about that. I didn't mention that. You can actually inject new code. You can actually change the code that's running at runtime, which is insane. Of course, if you want to experiment that, if at all possible, you really are going to want a rooted Android phone. You're just you're not going to get the full experience with an unrooted phone just because you'll have to patch an APK and run the Frida gadget on there, and it's just it's not the same. So. What's the device plug name? It's the uh, Tuya, Tuya Smart Plug. It's, as you can see, it's very simple, very open API. I, well, open in that I opened it. You know, it, it wasn't open before this. You won't find any of this information anywhere. Hi, how do you put yourself in the foreground like that? I am using a green screen, which is directly behind me. It's all just green. And then I'm able to remove the background from, uh, from my picture. Oh, thank you so much for that. That's like uh, 15. Thanks for the stream. Lovely IoT stuff. Uh, oh, uh, loving IoT stuff at the moment. Yeah, I IoT is it's insane. Everything everything is connected to the internet now. It's only a matter of time before, you know, your your microwave and your refrigerator. Or I'm sure it's already Wi-Fi fridges. I know I was talking to somebody the other day. I'm having to replace a couple things at my house, and they're talking about like. Oh well, this thing's gonna have Wi-Fi now, and I was like, you know, why would this thing have Wi-Fi? You know, so everything is hooked up to the internet now. Everything is driven, and the other thing is like a lot of these things use a lot of the same tools. You know, like this ESP eighty two sixty six Wi-Fi module is one of the most popular Wi-Fi modules on the planet. You'll probably find them baked into a hefty percentage of of IoT devices. So like when I broke this apart. I was not surprised to see this exact Wi-Fi module in here. And I'm sure the same is true of a lot of other devices. Can I turn your lamp off? Sure. If you want to, if if you can turn my lamp off, you can turn my lamp off. Definitely. Definitely do it. Actually, if you go if you go back in the chat and you look at the actual URL and whatnot, I know it's hard to copy. There's no way to copy it, but you can easily turn my lamp off. In fact, what I'll do is I'll post a uh, <laughs> I'll post these URLs and the headers and the response bodies. I'll put them in Discord and people can turn my lamp on and off. It'll be fun. I'll, I'll put like a I'll put like a, a webcam feed so you can try it out. All right, well, that's pretty much the end of the stream. I just want to, we had a big stream today, uh, 300 and, 
think it said 334 people at, at max. That was huge. I, I knew it was going to be a good one. This is a really cool topic. It's very interesting. And any, any technologist or somebody interested in programming or reversing things, this is, this is just like on point subject matter, something you're going to want to look at. So uh, as usual, I saw a lot of the same people at the streams. Thank you so much for coming to the streams. I see the same names a lot. I also see a lot of uh, new people. So if you're a first time stream viewer today, uh, welcome. If you want to go further with everything that's going on, I do have a Discord server. Somebody will post a link in the chat here in a second. And you can come see us over there. We got about 6,300 people of which eight or 900 are online at any given time. So there's um, a wide variety of talent a wide variety of backgrounds and lots of stuff that's going on there. So uh, I'm also always on there. If you want to come say hi to me, I'm, I'm always on there. Uh, also remember stickers are available in the chat. You can get them right now at cost emkc.org slash stickers uh, on the stream. So far there's been three orders. So I'll be uh, putting those in the mail on Monday. So thanks to those people that pick some of those up. If you want exclusive engineer man stickers, you can get them there. And that's, that's pretty much it. So the next stream is going to be two weeks from now. And that topic is going to be, what are we doing? Ooh, the role of blockchain. So two weeks from now, we're going to be talking about blockchain. We're going to be talking about blockchain, how it fits into like industrial blockchain applications, how it fits into these like you know, like the smart contracts, how it can be used as a generic tool just for immutable history. We'll talk about its role that it plays kind of into cryptocurrency as well. It'll be all about blockchain. We'll talk about some of like, if you want to develop against blockchain technology, how you might do that. So if blockchain is just this black box that you don't understand at all, come to this stream and it won't be a black box that you don't understand anymore. I'll definitely hook everybody up with that. And I think that's that's pretty much it. So again, uh, thank you so much for coming to the stream. I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of their weekend. And if you have, if you want to go further, if you have any questions, anything you saw today on the stream, you can either, if you're watching this live, go ahead and go to my Discord server. Let's chat there. If you're not watching it live, go ahead and put it in the comments below. And other than that, I will see everybody later. Have a fantastic rest of your weekend. Take care.